Good evening. Can everyone hear me? I think we're ready to get started now. I'm not sure. Hey, it's working now. I think it's on. Good evening. I'm Keith Loiso, University Architect at Vanderbilt, and I just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. This is our second in a three-part series of Making Nashville Living Building Ready. So we started our adventure on making Nashville Living Building Ready about a year ago, meeting with metro officials and state officials and others uh, to see really what would it take to implement a living building in Nashville. But the good news is it's been a very positive uh, feedback. And, um, and from that, and to kind of expand on that, Vanderbilt is really kind of looking at options uh, to do a living building. And this all started with our uh, future VU, which is really more than a land use plan, um, but kind of looking to the future of Vanderbilt's campus. And it's considering a lot of other factors like community and neighborhoods, um, diversity and inclusion, and then um, walkable and sustainable environments. And so that's what's leading us tonight is uh, in the topic of sustainability. So um, on that same note, um, we've uh, undertaken a renewable energy study that is coming near completion, and then also started, kicked off our Blue Sky Vision session, which is really looking at the university's energy needs for the next 20, 50, or 100 years. And, um, but it's called Blue Sky because the concept is really to, to go beyond uh, what we know today and maybe even think big to even what future possibilities could lead to. So this is kind of showing our, um, our greenhouse gas reductions over, over time. We started monitoring these back in 2005. And you can see that we did a, quite a substantial reduction to 2015. But then it greatly dropped to 2017. That's when we took our coal burning uh, power plant offline and went with uh, natural gas fired turbines. So we're looking at glide paths on how we can bring those emissions down further and also reduce our energy. So one of the things that we've been doing, of course, um, we've had a history of doing some lead and sustainable buildings on campus. We've done 17 buildings uh, to date that are certified and we have uh, more buildings in the pipeline. Uh, for our School of Nursing, we're looking to do our first well certified building and also uh, we're exploring a pedal, uh, a living building pedal for a home ec and Mayborn project that's um, in design currently. So really lead buildings reduce kind of the environmental impact, but then living buildings is what we're talking about tonight and it's all about regenerative buildings. So they're buildings that produce more energy than they use. They produce their potable uh, drinking water from water that, that's found on the site. It takes care of all of its needs pretty much on the site, but it's done in a way that, that is beautiful, uh, an environment to be in, and then that's a healthy environment for, for folks to be at. So anyway, with that being said, um, Lanier is here. Lanier Lang Langdell is going to be introducing the speakers tonight, and uh, Lanier is our future vice president for our Student Government Association. Thank you. It's really exciting to be a, a little bit a part of tonight. Um, so our first speaker I have on my list is Howard Wertheimer, who is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and a lead accredited professional. After leading the Capital Planning and Space Management Department for many years, he was recently promoted to Institute Architect at Georgia Tech. Howard has strategic oversight of the Campus Master Plan, Landscape Master Plan, Historic Preservation Plan, Campus-wide Sustainability Initiatives, Curation of Public Art, and most things that are visually exposed. So my second speaker is Mark Deminak, AVP for Facilities and Operations and Maintenance with Georgia Tech. Mark leads a team of approximately 500 staff members who are responsible for keeping the city of Georgia Tech operating in a safe, efficient, and sustainable manner. 
The major operating units he oversees include physical plant and utilities infrastructure, building maintenance, engineering and, eng and energy strategy, building services, custodial staging, lock shop materials management, landscape and fleet services, and solid waste management and recycling. Joshua Gassman is the Sustainable Design Director at Lord Ake Sargent, based in Atlanta. For nearly 20 years, he was, the, and for, where for, I'm so sorry, where for nearly 20 years, he has led large multifaceted design teams focused on sustainable design. He has worked extensively on projects involving challenging sustainable criteria, including net positive water and net positive energy projects. This includes leading the design team for the Candata building at Georgia Tech. He holds degrees from Washington University in St. Louis and Arizona State University. And lastly, Jose Almignana. Jose joined Andropogon Associates in 1983 and has been a principal since 1995. Trained as both a landscape architect and architect, his collaborative work has been instrumental in many of the firm's complex site development projects, striving to create sensitive ecological designs that respond directly to site conditions and incorporate innovative, innovative sustainable, and regenerative design technologies. Jose received the ASLA's President's Medal in 2010. Jose is a visiting lecturer at the School of Design and at Drexel University. He has worked on two fully accredited living buildings. Jose currently serves on the city of Philadelphia's Art Commission as an appointed commissioner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Give me one second while we change this thing over. Okay, magic. Technology worked without any hiccups. Excellent. Um, to, to start with, really fast, raise your hand if you are an architect. All right, you guys will understand and love half the presentation. Raise your hand if you're an engineer. You will love and understand the other half of the presentation. <laughs> and raise your hand if you're something else. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Landscape architects. Okay, so you'll and you'll understand everything. <laughs> All right. So um, wanted to look real fast at at, at some of this. Um, for those people who do need continuing education credits, we've got a slide here um, <clears throat> to conform with most of the requirements for these things, learning objectives. But let's not dwell on those. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, about the living building uh, at Georgia Tech and about the living building challenge and how we got there and, um, and why we're doing this as well. So um, I, I had one other question I almost forgot to ask. Who was here uh, when we were here discussing the project in March? Okay, excellent. Mo uh, good chunk of people. Excellent. So a lot of what the, this intro section has in it is stuff that we elaborated on quite a bit, so I'll go through it kind of quickly, but if there are questions, certainly we can, we can address them. But the gist of living buildings here is to create buildings that are actually regenerative, right? Buildings that are giving back. Um, and <clears throat> Keith kind of hit on that a little bit in terms of lead buildings that <clears throat> are really always comparing back to a baseline of X amount of performance better than code. And in this case, what we're really looking to do is be truly regenerative and give back. Um, <clears throat> the metaphor of the flower was mentioned briefly, so the living building challenge has petals, but the idea is a flower is rooted in its place, it's adapted to its site, gets all its energy from the sun, collects all its own water on site, and generates all its food, and has no waste that isn't a part of a, e a closed loop ecosystem that feeds something else. And so that metaphor sort of builds back to all of the ways we think about living buildings. Uh, the petals, uh, as you can see here, are, uh, there are seven of them. They each encompass different components of a holistic design. They're all completely interconnected. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. But what we're really thinking about today in this particular piece is the place pedal, the water pedal, and a little bit about the equity pedal. And specifically, we're going to go into these three imperatives. Net positive water is deceptive. It's a very simple concept, but it actually has a tremendous amount to it. We'll spend a lot of time 
um, <coughs> talking about that, uh, looking at urban agriculture on the site and how that's integrated, uh, as well as access to the place. And before we get to all that, Mark and, and Howard are going to talk a lot about the context on Georgia Tech and how the campus is managing this, and then Jose and I will kind of dive into uh, where we are on the campus. Uh, let's see. Um, the, one of the key differentiators of the Living Building Challenge compared to other, <coughs> I like to call them sustainability measuring sticks, is it is very performance based. So you cannot be certified completely in the living building system until you have built the building, you have owned it, you have operated it, and it's been operational and that operation has been documented for at least a year to prove the net positive water and the net positive energy components. Um, <clears throat> one thing also always want to keep in mind that this is a very large team. This is, uh, we've got four people here talking about it today, but we have many, many, many colleagues across many disciplines, including the funder of the Candida Fund, <clears throat> who have supported the project uh, throughout its duration. Um, very important as we start to think about how all of this comes together, everything is interconnected, right? In nature, you find if you push on one thing, it pulls elsewhere. Uh, we like to talk about the project. If you push on one thing, you make it change over here, three other things change over here, and then you've got to push those three to get them back in line, and then three different things over here pop out, and we're constantly trying to figure out how to make a, a four-dimensional or even a five-dimensional jigsaw puzzle work completely. Um, the, I'll go through a little bit of the site, but I think Howard will elaborate a little bit more on the site, but in general, we're looking at a massing concept here that, um, that puts the building on the, on the site. Uh, it's about eight acres, this entire piece, and again, Howard will elaborate on that. But our design concept was to really think about an open space that is open to the west in terms of program with a large open space in the, in the middle as an atrium. Um, so quick rendering of the, the south facade, which is effectively our front door, um, sort of moving through and into the building, the large open space program, uh, program open to the west over here <coughs> with the large auditorium space at the end. Uh, from the second floor, we've got two large classrooms on the top, and then direct access to a planted roof as you walk out from this floor to the back. And we'll talk <clears throat> more about that as well. And as we start to talk about the water pedal and how we're collecting water, we want to make sure everyone keeps in mind this idea of the green line here is the footprint of the building, and this is the footprint of our photovoltaic array that's generating all the electricity for the project. And we're actually collecting off of all of the photovoltaic array to, uh, to collect water and that becomes important. And then a quick view from the west of the west facade. Uh, so last time we were here, we talked about energy. We spent a lot of time talking about energy and how we got to net positive energy. Um, this is one slide summarizing about an hour and a half of discussion. But the gist of it is we're, talk, uh, we're looking at a performance EUI. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with that term, it's a way to think about how much energy a building uses, and it's normalized because it's, by per, it's per square foot. So we're looking at about 34. Um, a CBEX building, uh, which is a sort of average built building right now in the environment, is about 83. So this is about 66-ish percent improvement over that. But of course, we're building enough PV onto the project to make it net positive. And so that's closer to about, we're offsetting about 40 EUI equivalent. Um, and then you can see the size of the, the PV array and how many kilowatt hours we're, we're using in a, or anticipating using, I should say, in a year. So with that, I'll turn it over to Howard and Mark. Thanks, Joshua. So uh, out of curiosity, how many people uh, are from Vanderbilt in the room? And how many from the city of Nashville? Any other just sort of interested citizens? Anyone being dragged here <laughs> besides my wife and daughter? <laughs> All right. So um, how many people have been to Georgia Tech? Uh, so a few of you. So uh, Atlanta is right there. Nashville is right there. So uh, just to put you in geographic context. Uh, and there are a lot of similarities. Um, so I, I was doing, I'm doing a presentation for Another uh, activity, and I sort of got looking at maps, and it's amazing what you can find on Google. So here is sort of, uh, solar insulation, and Nashville and Atlanta sort of you know, in similar zones. 
And to do a uh, living building uh, and to be net positive energy, uh, access to the sun is really important. Uh, water is also important. So uh, it, I imagine it would be pretty hard to do a living building in a desert environment, uh, but we do have droughts to consider. So that's sort of a factor as you sort of look into all of this. <coughs> um, I just thought this was kind of fun that where the tornadoes have been mapped over the last 56 years. And then light pollution map, and uh, sadly, Atlanta is sort of the a hotbed in the, in the southeast. And I think Nashville's probably right about there. Um, and then there are a lot of McDonald's in Atlanta. <laughs> And there are also happy states, and Georgia's slightly happier than Tennessee, at least by uh, this metric. I'm not quite sure uh, what people in Texas are so happy about. Maybe, Mike, you can explain that later. And, you know, we do have a lot of commonalities, so everybody in the room says y'all. And uh, so. And then, similarly with the weather, um, <laughs> Uh, but we, this map probably should be updated to say if there's conversations that it might snow, everything shuts down. So, uh, you know, we do have uh, Project Vision for the, for the uh, it's now called the Candida Building for Innovative Sustainable Design. It was just sort of the Living Building Challenge at Georgia Tech. The donor is the Candida Fund, which is a private philanthropic organization. And uh, we were very blessed and fortunate to re receive a grant of $30 million to do this project. $25 million for the construction and another $5 million post-construction for other activities that we will, we will do. But we wanted to create <clears throat> the most environmentally advanced education research building on a university campus in the southeast until Nashville and Vanderbilt does its living building. Uh, but, you know, our commitment to sustainability has really sort of, it's been grounded in our campus DNA. So this is a picture of the campus in the 1920s. All the buildings are red brick, indigenous of the red clay in Georgia. Uh, the football, track, and baseball are all on the same piece of dirt. Uh, I don't think that exists on any university campus anymore. Uh, so it's really great utilization of the land. And then there once were streams that roamed through the campus. And uh, this is important, and you'll see why in a few minutes, but um, the location of the living building is sort of in this sector of campus, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. And over time, these streams have been buried in pipes and are no longer uh, visually exposed. <clears throat> this is what the campus looked like, uh, you know, uh, shortly before I arrived at Georgia Tech and before Mark arrived there, uh, sea of asphalt. Um, and you can actually drive up to any building, which was great, and parking enforcement wasn't very good. And I sent this picture. So this is sort of what the sector of campus where the living building will be located. This is what it looks like today. And we'll transform it to uh, this is what it looks like right now. <clears throat> so uh, getting rid of the uh, impervious surface, creating pervious surface. Uh, this, there's a 1.4 million gallon cistern in the middle of this green space right there. We got rid of all the surface parking. And uh, so I sent that other, the previous photo to a friend of mine who works at Coca-Cola, who has their world headquarters across the street. I said, can you just take a picture with your iPhone and, you know, same view. And so she sent this, and I didn't realize that they have cameras on their campus. That, so this was a date stamp picture. So it was sort of interesting. But, you know, this is what the campus looked like. We, you know, way back when we're, you know, campus safety and construction was not really important. Uh, parking enforcement really did not exist. <laughs> and uh, that has changed dramatically, as you can imagine. Uh, shortly after, you know, Georgia Tech was the Olympic Village for the 1996 Olympics. Uh, shortly after that, we uh, did a campus master plan. About that time, we were about seven and a half million square feet and about 12,000 students. And then just a snapshot, you know, uh, not too long ago, we were a little bit south of 16 million square feet and about uh, 23,000 students. And that, those numbers have all gone up a little bit. So our appetite for space has been pretty robust over the years. One of the unique things about Georgia Tech, and Jose is aware of this, you know, most campuses have a uh, campus master plan. Very few have a standalone landscape master plan. 
And this landscape master plan has been updated several times. And we really care about sort of that uh, ecological and human landscape and the space between the buildings. Uh, we want to create, we want to reduce the stormwater runoff on the campus. And we created what we call an eco commons, which is this green donut that sort of wraps the campus. It's about 80 acres. Uh, Georgia Tech is about 400 acres, 16 million square feet, 200 buildings. And we want to increase our tree canopy. And just as a point of reference, you know, that's the zone uh, of the site for the Candida building, which is sort of about right there and part of the eco commons, which we'll, I'll show you some images in a moment. So, um, you know, we did, we had one lead building at Georgia Tech when I arrived. And with lead buildings, you do a cistern, and typically there's no real data of why or how big you sort of design that cistern. It's just say, okay, we'll do a cistern, and you decide whether it's above ground, below ground, what material it is, and we only want to spend X number of dollars. Uh, but we did a cistern master plan, looked a little more holistically, and my goal is to not use any potable water to meet our irrigation needs on campus, not use any potable water to flush toilets in new construction, and significant renovations. So all of our athletic facilities, I'm gonna use this other pointer. Josh gave me a dud here. Uh, so all of our athletic facilities are all uh, irrigated with harvested water from cisterns. So about 50% of the campus is irrigated with, the, the parts that we irrigate are irrigated with harvested water. And there on the bottom left, you can see that 1.4 million gallon cistern. But you know, several years ago, we had a drought on campus. And obviously, when there's a drought, there's no water for those cisterns. <clears throat> so we developed a stormwater master plan that you know, tried to build in some resiliency to what we do. And that red horseshoe that you see right there is a black water reclamation facility that we are planning. Uh, we're hoping to sort of move that forward in the very near future. Uh, there are a lot of legal hurdles to uh, overcome. But we're sort of working through that process. <clears throat> so part of the eco commons, we have sort of this first phase that we built, and you know, it's just—it's uh, really just an engineered waterway that, uh, with you know, engineered soils. But this is what it looks like after a rain event. Uh, we don't anticipate students coming to campus with canoes or kayaks, but it's a great learning opportunity for education, research, and a recreational amenity. And we'll—and uh, Jose has sort of did some conceptual design on the eco commons in that eight-acre parcel. And then we have a, an app that we developed, and this is a free app. You can, they, these lines actually wiggle and move, and you see how the water turns. But that's that 1.4 million gallon cistern and the Clough Commons building right there. So the water goes up. It's used to flush the toilets. We have a green roof on the building, and that water is used to irrigate not only the green roof, but uh, about a 16-acre basin uh, of campus. So I put this map together a couple of years ago just to sort of take a snapshot of where we were and sort of our commitment to sustainability. <clears throat> and we have uh, about 3 million square feet of LEED certified buildings on our campus. The last four buildings were LEED Platinum. And so I came up with a metric, you know, just because I work at an engineering school, and we said we're about 128 uh, LEED square feet per student. And I gave this slide to our president, and he was on a panel with other university presidents. And uh, the next day, I got several emails from my colleagues at those universities saying, we're at 95, we're at you know, whatever. So Keith, you can, you could add that metric. So almost 20% of our campus uh, buildings are uh, LEED certified. This was our first LEED Platinum building. Uh, it's a carbon neutral energy solutions lab. It was at a high bay building. We got some uh, a matching grant from NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology of $11.6 million. So those of you who pay federal taxes, thank you very much. We appreciate it. But one of the things that we did here, and, and this is something we met with Keith and some of his colleagues uh, right before this. Um, so we have this high base space right here. And we elected not to cool that space. It's heated with radiant heating in the floor. And we have louvers down low and louvers up high and uh, very large fans that sort of move that air through. So days like today when it's 90 degrees outside and 60% uh, you know, humidity, inside it's about 78 degrees. So it's actually fairly comfortable. But we elected to not provide air conditioning. If it, and if it did not work, then we would add the air conditioning later on. Uh, Clough uh, uh, Undergraduate Learning Commons, probably one of the largest LEED Platinum buildings on a university campus, about 230,000 uh, gross square feet. 
Uh, there you can see the, the green roof, an 85 kilowatt PV array on the roof. And uh, here you see the, uh, you know, this wonderful roof garden. I'm not sure where these students were before we built this building, but they're here. And those of you, uh, there was a movie that was briefly in the theaters called The Internship. Anyone see that? With Vince Vaughn, Owen Wilson, Rose Byrne. So that was filmed at Georgia Tech. And uh, I had a little cameo with Rose Byrne. So, and you, want to, you want to see that again? So. <laughs> so that was my 15 minutes. Uh, so we just, this is an uh, interdisciplinary research building, uh, just got lead platinum, also recognized by the American Institute of Architects Committee on the Environment as one of their top 10 sustainable buildings in the country. And uh, we're really proud of this. And, and what we've done is there's, uh, this is uh, the, the trees that you see lined up there. Uh, we just sort of set up our own little um, uh, tree farm and as a placeholder until we put a new building there and then in the fall those trees have grown so in the fall this fall we'll transplant those uh, across campus and plant new seedlings in this location but one of the things that happens when you do campus development there are some trees that you lose um, either through campus development or disease or, or storms and in the past we would just turn those trees into mulch and we developed a tree cycling program where those trees were cut, they were milled, and then they became the stairs, the connecting stairs in the building and the benches throughout this five-story building. So now the building tells a story about its sense of place. And now we have an inventory of, what, 50 trees, Mark? At least. At least 50 trees, and we're making them available, and some of those trees will be used in the living building. So the sector plan, so as a point of reference, the building we were just looking at, uh, EBB is right there. Um, but we did this sector plan as part of the engineer biosystems building. So here you see that future building where that tree farm is located. But this is sort of the zone of campus where this eight acre parcel where we anticipated uh, the location of the living building. And there are a few other things that had to happen. Our campus safety facility currently is there. We're building a new one up here. Uh, this is all surface parking. We're, we're building a, a structured parking deck here with an office building laminated to the front, and we had a placeholder for another building. And that other building ended up being uh, the Candida building. So you've seen that image. So you know, there are some uh, uh, goals that, that Candida had in you know, their, uh, you know, our obligation to them that we wanted to accomplish, you know, obviously to construct a living building that's fully certified. Uh, we want to create leverage opportunities to educate others, just like all of you in the room tonight, uh, that you can learn and hopefully apply some of these strategies to other projects that you might be doing. And then we really want to be the pebble in the pond that begins to transform the industry uh, in the southeast and, and much glo more globally than that. And replicability is a big part of that. It's not to say that you're going to take this building and construct it on your campus or in your community, but there may be aspects that you might find appropriate. Uh, so what we did, uh, we sort of came up with a fairly unique uh, solicitation process for the design teams. So this is, uh, we hired the designers uh, through one uh, solicitation and the construction manager through another, but we did an ideas competition. So we shortlisted three teams, uh, we gave them each a stipend, I'm always reminded and honest that it wasn't enough but, uh, uh, and uh, we didn't know what a living building was all about. And we had students involved in the process. We have uh, other folks from, from Georgia Tech uh, plugged into these conversations. But we had some specific goals that we wanted to achieve. You know, we wanted to learn about the living building. Uh, we wanted to uh, educate ourselves. We wanted to jumpstart the design process um, and begin to transform the uh, architect engineering construction industry and then think holistically is, you know, this is the red circle is the site that we were looking at and Georgia Tech, as I mentioned, is about 400 acres and we start with every project site being 400 acres until we whittle it down because everything interconnects. You have uh, utilities, you have stormwater management and runoff, tree canopy, transportation, pedestrian pathways, all of those interconnect and you need to take those into consideration. So just through this ideas competition, uh, the national impact was pretty, pretty remarkable. 
So all of those three design teams had representatives and specialty consultants from around the country. So the impact, uh, and this is before we made our final selection. And we embedded ourselves in the uh, offices of the design teams once. So we did the short list in December of uh, 16, no, 15. And then in uh, January and February, we had workshops in each of the team's offices. And we were just observers to see how they work and understand their chemistry. And we did that two times in each firm. And there's an action photo of Jose. Uh, and that was actually really important, you know, because it was the landscape architect that did the analysis of the site and not the alpha dog architect saying, I'm going to put the building here and you, everybody else, you figure it out. And that was really pretty provocative for many of us at Georgia Tech. We had uh, College of Architecture students doing a living building in their studio. These were graduate level students. Uh, so, you know, we had folks from the Candida Fund and we have an external planning and design commission review board. Uh, we were all in attendance watching these students present their ideas. And then during the interviews, you know, there were models and boards that had to be developed that were part of the, the deliverable process. And there were about 50 students in that studio, and all of those students had the opportunity to uh, uh, observe and participate in the workshops, as well as the, the uh, final interviews, which I think is pretty unprecedented uh, in architecture education. And all the teams did remarkable jobs doing all these models. We put them on display, again, to, to help educate folks across our campus. This was the massing diagram that, that you saw Joshua talk about. And they really sort of understood the, the connection between the architecture, the landscape, the engineering, the technology, the ecology, and uh, yeah, at the end of the day, fiscal stewardship, because it is a very real project. So the integration with that, that eco commons was important. So here you see, here's the building footprint. So with a living building, the dash red line is the project site. And you see hints of blue right there, so that's where that water that is currently buried underground would be visually exposed. And here you see a little closer in. And then universal accessibility is really important, which goes beyond ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. So we want to make it uh, universal design is very important to us at Georgia Tech. Um, you saw that and a few renderings here. So here's the floor plan of the building. And, you know, the atrium space is sort of this big open space. The front door is off to the left here. Uh, about 160-seat auditorium. We have, uh, you know, open office area for about uh, 15 people or so. Uh, no faculty offices. We have class labs, maker space, a little breakout area, in student commons, seminar room. And then on the second floor, 275-seat classrooms and three additional class labs and uh, the roof garden and, and roof terrace area. Um, and then we're being very deliberate about who goes in this building and what classes are taught. So with the provost's office and the registrar's office and representatives from all of the colleges, we figure what are the most appropriate classes to have in this building to expose as many students as possible to uh, what, it, what it's like to be in a living building. And then those of you who are architects or engineers or owners, um, you know, people ask, you know, how big is the building? So square feet is a metric that people, uh, numbers stick. And it was important that we sort of, you know, be very clear about what these numbers are. So we have about, most people refer to uh, how big is a building as the condition space. Well, we have about another 10,000 square feet of very deliberate program space that is not free. So you do a roof garden or a, a covered porch, that is not free. So we sort of look holistically. So, you know, this building, as all the program, is uh, just south of $400 a square foot. That engineered biosystems building that, we, that I showed you a few minutes ago, two years ago it was completed at a cost of $400 a square foot. So the upcharge to do a living building is not that significant. At least it was not for us at Georgia Tech because of that deep commitment to sustainability. A few more images. One of the things we do on all of our projects, we do integrated sustainability charrettes, and we have students, faculty, staff, members of the design team, construction team in there determining what is important to us. So this project is no exception. However, for the living building, uh, biophilia is a really important component, and we did a biophilia charrette, 
And we actually had the executive director from the uh, Botanical Garden in Pittsburgh, who has three living buildings on their campus. He came down and spent the day with us, which was pretty remarkable. And you know, I actually thought materials would be the easiest of all the seven petals because there were other living buildings that preceded this one. So, okay, here's the shopping list. Well, um, I learned very quickly that's not the case. It's really very difficult. But I'm just going to focus on a couple of things. And you know, places like Nashville and Vanderbilt, where you do demolition and you have resources. Um, so this was uh, our alumni building. We had to put a new roof on it. That slate was taken off and stored off-site. And it's the wall tile in the restrooms on the wet wall. There's actually an organization in Atlanta called the Life Cycle Building Center. And they're a nonprofit. And they take uh, building materials and building waste and rather you know, diverting it from the landfill to make it available for building owners to, to uh, incorporate in their projects. Uh, one of our buildings, Tech Tower, had these very large, whoop, uh, these very large uh, joists that we had to take out because we put in a new fire stair in the building. And you can see the thickness of those, so they are now the stairs and com communicating stairs in the living building. Uh, the film industry is very big in Georgia, and typically those movie sets go into the landfill. So we've captured the two by fours, and uh, so the structure is two by, so this is the underside of the, the, uh, the floor deck and the ceiling. So there's two by sixes that span 10 and a half feet, which is a structural module. And then between each two by six is a reclaimed two by four from, uh, from those movie sets. And, and someone said we should get them autographed by uh, the movie stars so it might attract more people into the building. So that might change our water budget though, Josh. So we'll have to. And then some of the uh, tree cycling. So you know the design team identified some areas where we can capture these trees, cut them, and there'll be countertops on the second floor uh, common space. But it really changed the way we structure the conversations at Georgia Tech about designing and planning, designing, and constructing a building. So we set up these four different work streams, and people have been involved from day one, where you know, historically some of those entities might not get involved until uh, the building is under construction or perhaps even occupancy. Uh, with that, you know, the operations and maintenance, maintenance uh, folks, we did some pilot projects and, you know, Mark and his team have been leading these where, you know, looking at landscaping and different types of landscape and how do we uh, maintain things. We can't use Roundup. So how do you, uh, you know, do things with battery operated equipment or hand equipment? Uh, we have uh, environmental chambers on our campus, as I'm sure Vanderbilt does, and we uh, ran about 50 people through there. Our, mechanical engineer at Georgia Tech and the mechanical engineer from the design team uh, sort of did some things to monitor the temperature and the humidity. And we had people of different ages, uh, you know, different attires to sort of see what the comfort level was. So I'm just going to introduce water because Joshua and, and uh, Jose will talk more about this. But this, I think, is a really spectacular diagram that really is fairly simple. And uh, Josh will probably talk about this. But uh, you know, the different flavors of water, if you will, that sort of come in, you know, that are available to make it net positive. And, you know, I think this diagram sort of captures it where you see the, the rainwater. And again, if you're in a very you know, dry desert environment, this would be tough to do. But you sort of see the different streams of water and how they're, they're being addressed. And this is probably a little more technical than uh, you guys need. And yeah, I see some people, I'm going to leave these slides with Keith. So uh, you however you want to make them available, and they may be available on the Georgia Tech website as well. But we want to be, again, transparent. But, you know, how do you take rainwater and make it potable? So we're piloting that, and there are a lot of um, policy, public policy issues that are involved with this and with the local jurisdictions. So this is on the top of one of our buildings. And then, you know, with a coffee cart, it's, uh, you know, a lot of conversations about that because you have plug loads, you have water loads, Mark and I were in a meeting last week, and the conversation was around coffee cups, you know, that you have to bring your own coffee cup. Well, that works well if you're an employee or a student, but if you're a visitor, and we anticipate thousands of visitors, uh, that's probably an unreasonable burden to put on the vendor. They probably wouldn't sell a lot of coffee. 
and then you know to own and operate a building. So we have uh, uh, every two or three weeks we have a consultant helping us define uh, what that owner's manual will look, will look like and the operations manual that you know when Mark and I are gone that others need to sort of carry this this uh, vision forward and, and how do we understand uh, how this building will be operated uh, well into the future. You know, equity is one of the pedals that um, I, I think Georgia Tech will be the ones who will redefine what equity is for the living building challenge because it's something that people don't really sort of take into consideration very much. And there are a few things, you, you see these imperatives that are listed here, but um, one of the, as part of our reaccreditation, uh, all universities have to get reaccredited every 10 years. Ours is serve, learn, sustain, and Jenny Hirsch, who you see on the bottom right, is the director of that. So it's an academic enterprise for our undergraduate students, but it's really to think about everything much more holistically and how do we serve uh, the larger uh, community of the state of Georgia. And this was a, a, uh, a little uh, cartoon that I saw that talked about the difference between equality and equity. And I thought this was sort of neat until I came across this one right here, where there are no barriers uh, for anyone. And so how do we sort of create an environment where there are no barriers? And you know, uh, you know, great teaching is contagious. So how do we sort of set up an environment for the next generation of learners and teachers and sharers to integrate what we're doing into the pedagogy uh, of what we offer. Uh, there are students uh, who are, have their own pilot projects who have been very engaged. Uh, there are a bunch of, um, uh, we have the Ivan Allen College of Liberal Arts and some public policy students uh, you know, helped develop a tree cycling manual for Georgia Tech. And there you see some of our stockpile of, of trees uh, there were some civil engineering students that for some reason got enamored with urine segregation. I never even knew about urine segregation, but these students are really pretty darn smart. Um, this is a group of undergraduates. Um, they came up with a clever little acronym called SURF, and you know, they're looking at, it's a vertically integrated uh, project where we'll incorporate students at all levels and spiral for many, many years as students graduate out, other students will graduate in, and they'll come up with new projects along the way. Uh, and one of their, their ideas is to create this visitor impact map. So we'll do it in a digital format, but if you all come to Georgia Tech and go back to your, your homes, wherever that might be, uh, you put a button on the map, and we'll sort of see what the impact of this one modest little project has uh, across the globe. So doing living buildings, you know, Project schedules are important, uh, but they change, and it takes longer, and it's very important to get it right. You know, people will, uh, you know, fortunately we have the luxury of this not having to be implemented day one, uh, so we could extend things out to be much more deliberate in our conversations, and uh, we have been. So it's important, you know, people will forget, you know, and I'm repeating myself for you guys, from early, but you know, people will forget in a few years if a project was a little over budget or a little behind schedule, but metaphorically, they'll never forget if the front door is in the wrong place. So it's really important that you get one of everything in the right place and it works. Uh, and we wanna make sure we do that, particularly for this project. So there's a project under construction from last week coming out of the ground. Uh, you know, Campus-wide engagement is really, really important and community engagement. Uh, investing in those pilot projects. So you saw some from our operations and maintenance staff. You saw some from the academic and the students. And it's complicated. It's really hard. But you know, one of the nice things is we can't unlearn what we've learned. So these lessons learned, we're applying those to other projects across campus. I would hope that our design team and construction team are also doing the same for their other client organizations. So there are some resources out there with uh, websites that we have. Uh, Candida Fund has a website and a blog, there are webcams, and uh, yeah, it's been a, a pretty spectacular journey, and I'm just delighted to yeah, hitch a ride. So there's our light pollution. So that's all I've got. Now, Jose. So I will say, Jose works for this firm, Andrew Pogon, landscape architecture firm in Philadelphia. 
and they were just awarded from the uh, ASLA, American Society of Landscape Architects, the Landscape Architecture Firm of the Year Award. So, wow. you're higher. <laughs> Thanks, Howard. Um, well, I, if there's one thing that I can tell you, having done uh, a few of these projects um, and having worked through this one, uh, they're all incredibly intense, but they are transformative in more than one way. Uh, for the people that design them, for the people that make them possible, for the people that uh, eventually operate them, and for the people that use them. And I can guarantee you that the, the Nothing could be more true than what Howard just said. You know, once you learn this process, once you're made, a, once you're make aware, made aware of all these considerations, understanding that everything is interconnected, there's no way that everything is here. It's not like you put this thing over there, it disappears. No, it's here. It's not going anywhere. You will completely transform the way you relate to the environment. And this is actually the greatest gift that you have here. So, so the, the building... The, the Candida building doesn't occur by itself in that, uh, uh, in that fashion. It has to relate to the surrounding aspects of the site. And what you see here is the, the plant that was actually developed as part of the, the design for, uh, for the Candida building because we have to uh, adopt to the site conditions. And one of the things that this uh, uh, site has, which is, is simply a microcosm of the Piedmont, as you know very well here as well, you have slopes and you have to make everything accessible. And the building has to bow down to the site and the site has to come up to reach the building. And you, if you don't provide that communication and that interaction between the outdoors and the indoors, you will miss out on the opportunities to impact people. You know, we don't react for what we know, but we react to the things that we care about it. And that's a way to immerse people in this aspect of, of equity. Um, so as part of that study, we looked at everything that could be accessible under the American by Disabilities Act, which basically says you don't make a, a pathway that is steeper than 5%. But each one of them has to have a, a rhyme and a reason to occur and to actually reveal to you the landscape that you're moving through. Um, so the, the site in general comes around and connects to the building in a series of places, from either public transportation or internally through the campus, from various venues. Um, and then when you get closer to the building, the building is structured in such a way there is a series of um, different levels. that are interconnected, barrier-free, indoors and outdoors, so you can have access to the various uh, um, rooms and activities in the building. So you have the handicap accessible areas in solid and the non-handicap accessible where we have uh, steps in some places, including places where you can have bicycles stored. This is part of the access and part of the equity pedal as well. So the building on itself steps down from being the entrance level at zero in intervals of two feet. So the difference between the arrival point and the exit, if you wish, to the north is uh, is actually eight feet. Then you have a series of uh, pathways that enable you to actually gain access to any one place in the building without having to go through steps. Besides that, there's elevators inside of the building and so forth and so on that allow for that. And there's a series of actually pathways that are actually mapped out to connect with the rest of the eco commons. Uh, through this development of this path system, it's important that we have not only equitable access to all the places, but also to nature and to natural materials and processes. Because nature is not just about, you know, what we see outside that is green, it's the, it's the processes that are embedded that create this living system in front of us. And that actually transforms itself and expresses itself in the materials that we use and the processes that, that you have. The recycled wood that we talked about, it, that has a, it has, a, has a history to it. It has sequestered carbon, the pervious uh, materials that enable to establish the reconnection with the hydrologic cycle that all too often we sever when we do buildings and developments. And then the idea of being able to actually have access to all these features and, uh, and nurture yourself from them. 
So this is uh, a rendering of the second floor on top of the uh, um, auditorium looking towards the west, which is an interesting circumstance on the site. Uh, because the last thing that you want to do in the south, where you have that, much, that many hours of exposure of sun, is to face to the west, unless you have a very big porch, and this, this building has. But um, there's something else besides that that we, we will talk about in a minute. Um, to ground the project in place, the first thing we need to understand is where is the project located and what kind of environment does it belong to? And we have this fabulous tool, which is the ecoregions map that was developed by EPA, that tells us where, um, where the project is located and gives us a synopsis of what happens here. This is the lower Piedmont, that's where, um, where Atlanta is located. And what it does is that there's a series of landscapes that we utilize as reference plant communities. And the significance of this is that these types of landscapes have evolved over the mi millions of years to actually adapt themselves as communities to the site circumstances. So there's a lot of, uh, to learn from it. There's a lot that we can work with. There's a number of species that are indigenous to it, that are perfectly adapted, that actually create habitats for other species as well, which we want to um, we want to consider. We have uh, the, the typical landscape in this part of the country is uh, a mesic wet, uh, woodland, but there's also uh, a way of that water coming out of the ground in seepage woodlands. Uh, seepage wood, wetlands. Um, you have basically landscapes that shed water and landscapes that receive water. And understanding how that, uh, the water moves through the site is going to be pretty significant. One of the imperatives that we have to achieve here is that a portion of the site has to be dedicated to urban agriculture, to the production of food. And you have to go through a pretty rigorous set of calculations to understand how many square feet of your site have to be dedicated to that. And that has to do with the size of the site and the height of the building and the floor to area ratio. Uh, essentially, how dense the site is and, in what is it and where it is located. So we ended up finding out that we have a series of uh, uh, targets that we need to meet here. And then we looked at the production of food, but not just from a uh, human-centric perspective or anthropocentric per perspective. We're looking at it from a biocentric perspective. Can we produce food for all living systems here? Can we do produce nectar for, uh, for birds? Can we have nectar for pollinators? Can we actually have pollinators that actually pollinate blueberry bushes that give us food? Can we have bees that uh, actually are in hives and provide, um, and provide um, honey? And can we plant a landscape that we can forage, that we can have access to it? And we understand when it blooms and when it goes to fruit and when it becomes fall and changes colors and you know, something else stays there and understand that if we eat the blueberries, well, somebody else will not get to eat it, which also has to have access to it. Um, so, Intensive agriculture is immediately what you think about it when you do one of these projects because it's what we're wired to do because that's the way we think and there are beautiful ways to grow uh, food in urban environments. But um, we studied a number of alternatives of how to achieve the number of uh, square feet that we were uh, uh, faced to having to do in the ground, on the roof, and each one of these strategies would actually have an implication in cost, an implication on design, an implication of the way you move through the site, so forth and so on. But what would it take for intense agriculture to, uh, to succeed? And it all has to do with solar access. So if you have a site that is slopes away from the sun, like the one that we have right now, it's actually pretty difficult to have intense agriculture unless you go to the roof when you have a flat surface completely exposed. But it's also the place where we need to har harvest energy from the sun. So there's trade-offs here that we have to make along the process. They won't happen in a straightforward fashion and a straight line. It will have to take many different uh, paths. And we thought about the, an edible landscape of being part of that inspiration. So we can actually look at the landscape as a production of food, but not in an organized way, but through plant communities. 
and we think about the landscape in the form of uh, a mesic woodland, as I mentioned before, that sheds water, a seepage woodland that collects water and helps us manage the water that is, falls into the site, and an edible, an edible landscape that actually nurtures those that have access to it. Uh, so we have a series of species that are eco-regionally appropriate that not only provide food for, for human beings but uh, other animals as well and we can have honey from tulip trees as we know and um, black huckleberry that will have uh, fruits for ourselves and uh, human beings and for birds as well or the service berry which was used for uh, make jams by uh, uh, indigenous uh, people in this area, and then the ground layer that also has this opportunity to create all these uh, fruit-bearing uh, opportunities, and the building itself becomes an armature for having, uh, in the places where we have the right exposure, have um, uh, trellises where we can grow vines that during the summer months actually are going to be in leaf, and they're actually going to act as a shading device for the spaces behind, so we reduce the amount of insulation we have a direct contact with nature when we look through the buildings, produce food, and actually in the winter time, when we need the sun to warm us up, you know, they bow down, they lose their leaves, and allow the light to fill the rooms. Uh, how that works together is, is a cross section uh, through the porch of the building, is you know, through that path system that enables to have access to all these rooms. And along that journey is where you have opportunities to actually connect with this edible landscape and have access to it. So it is designed so you can reach out three feet, which is about as long as you want to reach out with your hand, and you can pick up the berries of the serval from the, from the amelanchiers, or reach down in the ground and get some of the huckleberries. And through that, you have this opportunity for all, for all people that come here, whether they come to the building or they just have journey, are taking journeys throughout the campus. So we'll talk a little bit more about the um, the water pedal right now, and uh, Joshua will make the introduction. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jose. <laughs> All right. So, sorry, I'm going to take a sip of water real fast, but... The, uh, the water pedal, as I was mentioning before, is deceptively simple, right? We're, we're, we're talking about... All you have to do is not use more than you can collect on the site. And when water hits the ground, all you have to do is make sure it flows off in an ecological manner. Well, this is, this is one of my favorite things because it is significantly difficult to actually accomplish those two very simple ideas. Um, so when we start to talk about water and how we started getting into this a little bit, we have to start to think about water in multiple tiers and multiple sources. So the first piece of the water pedal is starting to think about potable water, right? So where are we going to drink water? So we're going to collect it off of the roof, we're going to put, collect it in a cistern, we're going to treat it, and then we're going to drink it. This part is actually technically quite straightforward. Um, lots of systems have been built like this around the world. It's not very hard to do technically, but it is extremely hard to do regulatorily. Um, there are uh, lots of places that do not like you to do this, especially in a commercial building that serves more than 25 people. 25 people is typically the cutoff for um, most agencies that consider the building to be a commercial water provider and no longer residential. And so that's where you, you cross that threshold. This building, not even a discussion, clearly <laughs> has got a 500 FTE equivalent. So we've got to make sure 500 people have fresh water to drink collected from the roof. Um, the second piece of the puzzle is black water. We need to make sure that we understand what wastewater is and where it's going and how we're treating it. I'll elaborate on, on the comp composting toilet idea in, in a minute here. Um, and then we come to gray water, which is water that's used but not necessarily containing organic compounds, uh, which would make it black water. So gray water, this is, you know, if you wash your hands of the sink, it drains. Um, that's that. So we need a strategy to deal with that. In this case, also has to be treated on site and put back into the into the environment in a clean way. Um, then we come to stormwater or rainwater, uh, which then, when you look at a, the requirement for the living building challenges in a 10-year storm, you have to allow no more runoff than a pre-development site. 
So in this case, pre-development doesn't mean before we built the building because it was a parking lot. That would be pretty easy to do. In this case, pre-development means the Piedmont forest uh, that, that Jose was referencing, which is about 10% of the stormwater running off of your site. So that's actually quite a lot of water that we have to manage. Um, the good news is we're trying to collect a bunch of it to put in the cistern, so that really helps. Um, the other piece of this project, for, for those of you that, <clears throat> that were here in March and we talked a little bit about how we got to net positive energy, one of the things we were doing was connecting back to the campus loop. So that campus loop is chilled water. We are, uh, the campus is generating that water through a number of means, of the, primarily through a uh, chilled water plant that has a cooling tower. So that cooling tower evaporates water. So in order to get to true net positive, we have to account for that water use and offset it as a part of our net positive water calculation. And I'll go into a little bit more numbers in a second, but the gist of that is that translates in our, our rough estimates to about 75,000 gallons a year. Um, but we need to meter that and make sure that that number is exact during our monitoring period for the first year the building is open. Um, and then the, the last piece of the puzzle is fire protection. Um, you are allowed, uh, there's an exemption in the system that allows you to use municipal water for fire protection. Uh, in this case, our fire protection has plenty of pressure, so that's a, that's a good thing. Um, along the way, regulatory, not regulatorily, I should say, but within the living building challenge system, there are a number of other exceptions that are set up to allow for the greatest likelihood of success here. So the buildings that have been fully certified, that have gotten rainwater to potable, um, have wrestled with a lot of these issues. And with every building that gets done, it paves the path, and in some cases, different paths for other buildings to follow behind them. So one of them is, for example, the uh, introduction of chlorine into potable water. <clears throat> the Living Building Challenge does not allow chlorine. However, there's an exception that if the agency regulating that, which is different, all over the place, that's a whole different discussion. Um, they will allow um, chlorine in the building if it's the absolute minimum required. You exhaust all of your appeals along the way to ask them to please not make you do that, and you filter it back out before it's consumed. So there are a lot of things that we're trying to do to, to make all of this work. A um, number, uh, number of other things, the, the sewer, one at the bottom here is an interesting one. So in Georgia, in order to have an on-site treatment system, you have to have a backup site that is equal in size to your primary infiltration site. And you'll see that um, in the gray water diagram in a second. And the challenge with that is that our site is too small. We don't have enough room on our site to have a secondary infiltration um, uh, sort of a backup, a reserve in the future. So what we've done is we've connected to the sewer and we will put a meter on that. And then as long as that meter says zero flow when the building is uh, at the one year point, then that's okay. That's a part of uh, one of the exemptions here. <clears throat> so before we get into more, uh, the, the sort of nitty gritty of some of these strategies, um, in terms of regulatory agencies and things, I thought it would be good to give an update. So in terms of potable water, we have, and, and Howard had that great photograph of the mock-up we built on the roof. So we had to, as a, as a team, submit an application for Georgia Tech to become a commercial water provider. And so there are forms for that. There's actually an established process. And it took a little while to figure out how to get the right people in the room to sit down to say, yes, that's the right process. Please follow that process. And then you can go down that road. But once we got there, it was simply a matter of going through the, um, the testing that they asked us to do. So the first testing, of course, all these applications are written, assuming that these are municipalities looking at huge watersheds. And so the first thing you have to do is you have to test your water. Well, we haven't built the building yet. So that's the mock-up that was on the roof that you saw, was we built the PV panel and the sample of the roof, and we put that into a bucket. We needed a couple of storm events, and we had to send that to a lab to make sure that the water falling from the sky across our PV panel on our roof would be safe to drink. I think most people agree that by default it would be unless you had like pieces of lead <laughs> somewhere in your system, but the problem was that we needed to test it and show laboratory results. So we've done that, <clears throat> that's been submitted, and so we are now on to part two of that system, uh, sorry, of that process, and so we're working through that right now. Um, we received a permit from the, uh, from the county for gray water infiltration, which was a, a little bit of a, a dicey proposition for a little while. Um, a septic system in, in this part of Georgia is not an unusual thing. 
<clears throat> but the challenge we were up against was that they really wanted us to account for full toilet flow as a part of that. And we said, well, we have composting toilets. We don't have any water. And they said, well, that's OK. You don't have to do it, but you still have to size the system to be the right size. And we said, well, but our site's too small. And so all these things <clears throat> start to connect back to each other. And we were able to convince the county to give us the permit, uh, to give us the permit as, a, as a, quote, experimental system. And so that, again, goes back to the exception that they really allowed that because we had the sewer connection as a backup if we needed it. Uh, um, uh, let's see. Um, that's, that's sort of the regulatory update part. Um, there, there is a composting toilet component to it, too. Um, but basically, we're on state land. And therefore, the state is the AHJ for composting toilets. And given that Georgia Tech is the representative, and technically, by our contract, we're the authority having jurisdiction for that, we didn't have a problem with composting toilets. Um, so just a quick diagram, to, and Howard showed the biohabitats diagram earlier as well, is starting to look at what water does, right? In a pre-development site, water comes from the sky, and a little bit of it runs off. A lot of it is infiltrated, and, it's all, and it runs to creeks, which run to rivers, etc. In a typical building condition, water comes off the roof, goes right into the ground, goes into a sewer, and it becomes, quote, not your problem, right? Well, in cities like Atlanta that have combined sewer overflow and in storm, this is a really big deal. You get a huge storm event, the sewer starts to back up, it actually floods, and you can get sewage on the streets, and the, uh, and the, power, and the treatment plants are overwhelmed. So <clears throat> making sure we're not doing that is really at the root of the water pedal in terms of hydraulic <clears throat> um, natural flow on the site. Uh, the living building uh, we're, we're really trying to do is get back to that hydrological flow and only taking the piece of it that we actually need to create a closed loop. A <clears throat> quick analysis that, that we did early on to make sure that we had enough rain during the course of the year, and you'll see that this starts to impact the size of our cistern. <clears throat> this is where we get into lots of charts and diagrams, so try to <laughs> not dwell on them. But <clears throat> this is our anticipated water use. We've got about one and a half gallons per person per day. Keeping in mind, we're not flushing toilets with this water. We are, though, serving coffee, and we are washing hands, and we do also have teaching labs that use water. Uh, one of the things that Howard was talking about a little bit was, was working with the Academic Research Council to find classes that are appropriate to teach in this building. And one of the things that, that was a great dialogue, because part of it was we want all these young students to run through the building to have the greatest possible impact of the building. And we said, well, that's, that's great. What classes can conform to the following energy and water budgets? And we went back and forth, and we were able to find a series of classes. In fact, one ecology class was actually willing to change the pedagogy and the way they were teaching to conform to our water limitation in the building to not exceed these limits, which is a fantastic story in terms of the building having a ripple effect and impacting everything, not just in the design community, but also in the, in the university. Um, and we started looking at how big a cistern needs to be. This is our cistern level. So the water, um, the top line here would be if our cistern was full and where the white looks like it comes down, that's actually the blue line going down. And so it means the cistern's dropping. This is looking at 30 years of historical data. And what this is saying is based on our catchment area and in this climate, we are never dry, at least over the past 30 years. Now, what the next 30 years brings is a different discussion, but we feel pretty good about the size of the cistern. You'll notice it never really gets <clears throat> much below, even in the absolute worst case, uh, much below about 50%. Quick diagram of what the potable water looks like, but the gist of this is here. It's relatively straightforward, and the areas in gray, uh, in orange here are the, the chlorine injection, injection that we're trying to get rid of, but we probably won't be able to. When we start to look at even the potable water, though, it ties back to the site in an important way. We also have condensate water on the site coming off of some of our cooling equipment, and so we want to make sure that we're using that water intelligently. So in this case, we're tying it back, and we started cross-referencing that with the growth of urban agriculture and where our water demands might meet and tried to overlay these curves and see where they might coincide. And so luckily for us, we're generating a lot of condensate water at the same time that we really need to uh, irrigate our crops. So that's a great thing. Um, in terms of black water, one of the first analyses we did was start to look at how much water 
on-site treatment would mean. On-site treatment of black water is a tremendous regulatory burden as well as a water, uh, a water use. Now, if you close that loop, you can go through that. But what we see is that by going to composting toilets, we can significantly reduce the amount of water there. A number of different options in terms of treating black water on site, but really the scale of your building has a, has a huge impact. And you can start to think, though, not necessarily just at the building scale, but if you start to think about this on a campus scale or a sub-campus scale, you can start to change your strategies, and you can find different ways that um, <clears throat> might be more economical that might not work for a building that work for a series of buildings. Um, so we talked, I already mentioned composting toilets. Um, the gray water system, we're collecting water throughout the building. We're sending it down to a primary tank here, so everything out of the building gravity feeds. It's pumped back up. It's a very small half horse, uh, half horse power pump. It goes up to a wetlands here, which is the primary treatment. That wetlands is right at the front door. It has didactic value, has, allows people to see how we're treating that. And we then go through a sand filter to a dosing tank. And from there, we let the water gravity fall and down into this recharge where we're sending it back into the ground in the aquifer. And I'll let Jose elaborate a little bit more about our rainwater and stormwater system. Oh, OK, so one source of water, and it all comes from the sky, right? So um, that goes into gray water. Uh, you have the precipitation uh, that goes through, uh, through the collection in the roof, and it goes through a series of uh, devices until eventually comes into the portable uh, use of water systems. Uh, there's always going to be more water generated that we can use because there's a lot more water coming at uh, different intervals, so you have to plan for a certain amount of runoff to go off the site, and you need to meter it in such a way that you retain on site uh, up to 10-year storms, and we know that today's 10-year storm will be the five-year storm a few years from now, but that's another story. We'll work with whatever we have here. But what we also have as a system uh, and a source that we can use is everything that we can harvest from the AC condensate, which is actually quite significant and is uh, relatively clean water. It's basically the still water um, that we can use. So this is the way it lays out on the site. Uh, we have uh, essentially three roof areas, two from which we are collecting water that goes um, um, after it uh, fills up the tank for the cistern, and we know that we're going to have more water coming from the sky that we can actually use, but I think we have capacity for 60% extra in the cistern right now. That water is moved through um, the geometry of the building and the geometry of the roofs down through a discharge vault and using gravity to the extent possible it discharges the majority of the water at the top of the building. Because the building is uh, designed in such a way that accommodates a changing grade on the site, we can actually take advantage of that uh, uh, level differential to move water down in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a series of uh, steps with a series of those receiving landscapes in the forms of uh, rain gardens that feed back to the areas where the porch is, where we have the different activities coming out of the building. This is all calculated and metered, knowing how much fill we have to have on the site. We had a void, basically, here that we have to accommodate for because we had to accommodate the changes in grade to the site. And we're creating a, a layer where we can have pervious pavement and a subbed that if the bed is open graded uh, stone, we can actually have water and increase infiltration. And within that system, we can have a series of larger voids created with a series of pipes where there could be movement back and forth between the outdoor systems that receive water from the sky and the rain gardens and goes back into these areas uh, underneath the building and increase the capacity of the site to manage that 10-year storm. So there's a, a lot of resilience here being built into the, into the system. And a system that, as you can see, is not simple, is rather complicated. But at the end of the day, all we're trying to do is increase the time of concentration, the time of the water to go from the point of entry to the point of exit. The time that we, in, the, the majority, the, the more we increase that amount of time, the more opportunities we have to use that water and to infiltrate it and contribute to making that net zero 
uh, goal that we're trying, net positive goal. Uh, on the, on the um, great water side, we have the restrooms and the laboratories that come down to the primary tank that goes up to the constructed wetlands and then comes out. One thing that we, uh, we could do uh, should uh, resources become, become available and we proved that uh, we've done it in other projects that the water coming out of the constructed wetlands for gray water is uh, uh, of, uh, of, of, of a degree such that we can actually use it for irrigation. We can incorporate that water into the landscape system and actually increase the efficiency and gain more capacity for the site. So I think that um, this is one of the things that we want to think about it when we think of resilient systems, that we don't design them too tight together. Uh, so if one of, the, one of the pieces fails or underperforms, you're not left with a system that is not in operation. So the good thing about landscapes um, is they're alive and over time they evolve and become more efficient. Um, it's the only part of the building besides the occupants that is alive and there is an evolution. And to that, you need to think about the changes that are going to occur. If you manage that change over time, you increase performance and you uh, achieve uh, a, higher, a higher, higher goal. So that, that rainwater here is uh, captured by, by the various areas on the site. We do not have any water uh, coming out of the, 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 the green roof going to uh, potable water because it wouldn't be uh, adequate, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be uh, cold enough. Um, here's where, uh, where that system comes in in the cross section and here's where siting the building, the landscape, the porch deals with that uh, way of actually integrating the building to the site and related to the sun movement all the way across. So this is designed in such a way that the low sun in the west is actually um, screened by the vegetation on the site and then you can have a very comfortable space to be here. So building and site are working together to create a, a very, uh, very special microclimate. Um, and here is a rendering of what uh, we think this is going to look like when it's uh, completed. Happy yeah, absolutely, very happy. So um, one important fact, uh, uh, aspect of what we're trying to do here is that everything that we do uh, is an absolute, is mandatory. There's no ways of gaming the system. You either meet the challenge or you don't. And moreover, we need to prove performance. So we have no choice but to have monitoring systems in place and strategies in place to make sure that we are actually metering that. And um, when you're looking at a project of this type, you can't avoid but to think about the systems as being ones that have to be integrated with the site. It's not the building itself, it's not the site itself, it's the synergy between both. Um, in fact, I would argue that no building is carbon neutral unless it can sequester carbon, and you cannot sequester carbon without photosynthesis. So um, that's uh, a part that, uh, that I think is significant. So we think about the landscape as having to have a performative goal. You need to have the landscape do certain things. You set up those goals. You can externalize those goals by going to a rating system. But the fact that you know, the buildings are going to modify the way the water moves through the site and the landscape is going to be the recipient of it, the landscape has that capacity to actually clean the water and make it a resource available to not just human beings but other, other living systems. So when we have a similar system op operating inside of the building, we commission it, right? We want to know that what we design and we build is actually going to perform the way we we're trying to meet certain standards, ASHRAE or whatever it is. So it, it, is only, it is only fair to think about site commissioning as well because if we're expecting a site and a landscape to actually perform to a certain de degree, we want to make sure that what ha whatever has been designed and implemented and maintained over time because it's changing is actually part of that. So this is something um, that is now um, uh, in place through uh, some research work that we've done in our office commissioned by GSA where they're looking at actually using site commissioning as part of their um, uh, commissioning process for older, older buildings. 
Um, and, um, and what it does is that enables you to have a design process that, you know, is driven by a, by a series of goal settings, uh, monitoring methods, and monitoring equip, equipment inter, intervention to a building uh, component that you can monitor and make sure that it's designed the way it is, where you can actually measure what it happens afterwards, and then you have a feedback loop that enables that project to perform better. And then that creates a volume of knowledge that actually can actually be transformative from the industry uh, uh, at large. Um, the reason for that is very simple and is amply justifiable with this uh, triple bottom line. Uh, the advantages for that are quite significant. Uh, the paper that I showed you before is available for anyone, anyone that wants to see it where there is an exhaustive you know, uh, review, literature review, and, 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 um, and studies that can actually support uh, um, this, this capacity and these benefits that, uh, that sites have. And um, from the perspective of GSA, and I'm putting this up here because in, in a way, I think that Georgia Tech is actually trying to do this. They're actually trying to be transformative with their work and trying to do, do it in a way that they are really the pebble in the, in the pond. Well, GSA is the largest builder in the world. They own more, more square footages of real estate than anybody else. And they're putting this in place, which I think ultimately is going to be quite transformative. And here we are doing a project that is a living building challenge that has a lot of those in, in, ingredients uh, already baked into the cake. It's part of what you're trying to do and try, something that I think can actually be truly, truly transformative. Um, so. Yeah, the, the, the idea through, through this uh, site commission is that we can actually take it as the logical next step by which we're actually commissioning systems that go beyond the building wall because, you know, it's that synergy that actually enables us to achieve the highest possible goals. So, um, and that's that. So, so we're, 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 we're out of time, so um, we had some more, I had some construction photos, but we'll, 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 we'll stop and give people the opportunity to ask questions. Um, uh, this, was, this was pretty in-depth and pretty detailed, and so um, I'm sure people probably have questions, so. So I was actually listening to that podcast on my drive up here. Um, but I'll let Mark answer the question. I think Mark, you press the button on the side. Hey, it's not, there's a button on the side. There you go. So I was speaking to the facilities group from Vanderbilt earlier and talked about how when this thing began um, and I told my team about it and we explained what kind of the, in general what the concept was there were a lot of concerned looking faces out there um, you know my building maintenance team we have um, we maintain we have five maintenance areas zones we have a zone uh, maintenance concept at Georgia Tech and uh, all my area managers were just kind of stunned okay you know this sound this all sounds great but um, how are we going to do it? You know, we don't, we, we, we're just used to doing our, our thing a certain way. We, you know, you're telling us we can't use gas mowers for our landscape crew. We can't l use gas blowers. So you're telling me you're going to give me a sickle and I'm going to have to go out there and cut grass with a sickle and pull weeds by hand. Um, yeah. Goats, well, we've already had that. We, we've had the goats. Um, my custodial team, kind of the same way. You know, I have power equipment that we use in the building, sweepers, um, you know, buffers, polishers, those kinds of things. Um, yeah, they all kind of looked at me like, you know, what has Howard and all these architects gotten us into here? You know, how are we going to, how are we going to do this? And um, it didn't take that long, quite honestly, for the tide to turn. Once we had some more informational sessions, we began to talk internally uh, with the team and with, you know, the architects and 
uh, all the other folks on the design team. Um, you know, we, everybody kind of began to buy into it. We still have some trepidation. I'll tell you, the water piece is one that keeps me up at night um, because we're, I never wanted to be a, in the water treatment business, you know, but um, we're going to have to get into it at some point. But talking to some other living building colleagues around the country, um, we're gaining some more confidence that it's not as bad as we thought it might be. Um, we actually have some people on my staff that have had previous training as water treatment plant operators and they've kind of stepped forward and said, hey, I'd like to be involved in that. And um, so we're going to invite them in and get them the necessary training. But we're also going to have to have a consultant for the first year that specializes in that type of activity and have our guys just follow them around and shadow them, um, you know, during that process. So building service, you know, the custodial piece, the landscape piece, everybody's coming around. The building maintenance piece, a lot of new equipment in the building, uh, heat recovery chillers, something we don't have in, in radiant heating and cooling uh, from the, up from the floor. Um, a lot of that, we don't have that equipment now. And so we're going to have to spend a lot of time with um, the manufacturers and get some good commissioning, uh, training done during the commissioning process and make sure that Everybody has a full understanding of that. Um, the other challenge is, you know, we're, we didn't get a pot of money for maintenance that goes along with this gift that came along. And so I'm having to beg, borrow, and steal from my other zones uh, to, to provide those maintenance services. But we are going to get a few positions. So we'll have a, a few people that are kind of dedicated to the living building and that eco corridor that we're developing in that sector. So we're kind of learning as we go to some extent. Everyone's much more excited about it now than they were uh, back when things began. But, you know, it, we're, we're still going to have to learn some more things as well. So it's not, we're not out of the woods yet, but I think we're, everybody has a much better attitude about it. Yes, sir. UV right now, but we also, I think as Joshua mentioned, we, we're required to exhaust all other um, avenues, um, you know, looking at different filtration technologies and so forth, but at the end of the day, we may have to use some level of chlorine in the system. I, I get very nervous um, circulating, you know, uh, non-potable water into a system and having that many people um, going to be drinking it and exposed to it in the building. All it takes is one incident and, um, you know, you're in the front page of the newspaper and, and you've got some public health issues to deal with. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to look at that very carefully, but, um, you know, we think, we think we've got some, some good folks on the team studying it. So I, I, can, I can answer those. Um, is this one working? So the, the, the question was what happens if a raccoon um, decides to do his business on the roof um, and, and in terms of cleanliness of water, but also what about the gray water system and how clean does it have to be? I mean, rainwater has dust particles in it as well. Right. I'm not an expert in rain, but my understanding is there's condensation around rain or dust in the air, atmosphere, and then falls. So right. you do something on the UV Correct. So the, so the entire system, so rain falls on either the photovoltaic panel or the roof. It goes through the roof drain. It goes through a, a first flush filter, which is designed to remove sediment, leaves that may have gotten into the roof drain, um, other, other large debris. That, um, that diverts actually the first approximately 10% of water from any rainfall, and it goes directly into the site system. The rest of it goes down into the cistern after it's cleaned. At that point, it does go through a three micron filter and then UV treatment, and then, depending on regulatory approval or not, a chlorine piece. If we do chlorinate it, we'll then have to refilter it again before distributing it to conform with the living building challenge standards. So does that, uh, oh, and then on the gray water side, the gray water goes as, as gray water directly into a primary tank, and then it's pumped as is up to the wetlands, and it's the root, it's actually the bacteria on the roots of the plants that treats 
that water and then it goes through a sand filter and there's a turbidity counter on the other side of that filter and if it's not clean enough it actually recirculates that water back into the wetlands and then goes back out to the site and so if it's if it's not sufficiently clean it'll continue on that loop till it is before it goes back into the site but the site infiltration is the same technology that we'd use for a septic system which is actually normally used to treating black water so it's, it's there's no contact with people at all Uh, well, uh, it, over time, it will, ha it, will it requires well, maintenance to the, to, the, to the point in the first question, um, and we'll, it'll need to be cleaned out periodically, um, you know, five or ten years or so. You've got to demuck that tank. So the, so the question was uh, about air pollution infiltrating the water. And so uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Test Campus is actually adjacent to, the, to, the, to a six lane in each direction highway. And that was one of the reasons why we went through that testing protocol uh, on the roof that, you, uh, that Howard showed the picture of. And that came back. We tested it for, I think, 12 different things. And, and that was nitrous oxides were one of them. And they were, it was at an acceptable level. And, that, and some of that would come out in some of the filtration we're looking at anyway, too. But that's yeah, in the back. Yeah. So the, the, the question was about the arrow pointing from the gray water back into the building and, uh, and, a, and a compliment for the way we're looking at the, at the site. Um, the, the answer to the question is that was reflective of a system where we were sending that to a separate cistern in the basement and then pumping that back out for irrigation. Uh, we haven't really talked at all about construction costs, but needless to say, we all worked very, very hard to get this project to the dollar value that Howard showed. And so that irrigation, gray water to irrigation system, was one of the things we ended up removing from the project. Um, but as Jose was saying, it's something that could go back in in the future, provided certainly uh, if it's tested and the tank is added. Yes. Yes. <laughs> the, the way we're addressing that is our slab temperature is pegged to the dew point in the building so that, <clears throat> so that you'll never, in theory, allow the slab to get to the dew point. Um, there are moments when we could be in trouble with things like operable windows, which are a part of the living building challenge requirement. And in a lot of buildings, if you do something like leave a window open in your office and you get water on the floor, well, you'll learn a lesson and you won't do that again. You'll make sure the next time you close the window. Um, in this case, the vast majority of the building population is not, uh, is transient. So there aren't a lot of learning opportunities as it were, because if a student does that, then that's not there. So all of our windows are actually controlled centrally by the BMS based on uh, the, the building management system, based on what's happening uh, in terms of the weather, the humidity, et cetera. And so, <clears throat> so that's, a, a safeguard against that. Living building challenge does require local control though. So we have override buttons. So if the windows are closed or open, you can hit a button. It will change the position of them in that room. And then after a programmable amount of time, I think we're defaulting to 60 minutes, the windows go back to what the central core of the building tells it to be. We like to refer to a lot of the, the way we put technology together as state of the shelf. So the idea is to take things that are out there 
So no, we do not invent any of the technology that allows that to happen, but we're on the sort of front edge of putting all of these specific technologies together in the same place and used in a specific way. The maintenance of the composting toilet system, that was one of my largest concerns when we first heard we were getting um, composting toilets. And yeah, so the staff is already drawing straws over who gets to rake them, um, rake the, there's the, the casks where the, the pine bark, the pine chips are, um, are placed. So um, you get different answers on it depending on who you talk about. We visited Joshua and Howard and I, a bunch of other folks uh, from Georgia Tech, we visited several other living buildings around the country, and that was my first question to them. Um, depending on the volume of activity in the building, it varies quite a bit. Um, you know, one of the, I think, South Face we talked to in Atlanta, um, they hadn't really done anything to theirs um, since they've had them, and it was kind of surprising to me. Um, but the one we looked at up in um, New Hampshire, um, they had higher volume of folks going through there, and so they, they basically pumped out, the, the, the liquid waste was pumped out almost once a month. Um, they did have a monthly raking of the, I don't know, what do you call the, the, the tombs that the ch chips reside in? Um, yeah, the, the bins. The bins. Um, but it's a monthly activity. They actually have to open those and rake them, and I was concerned, you know, who's going to get that job, or who's gonna, ever going to want to do it? It's unfair to make somebody do that. But we stood right there, and they opened it up, and there was no odor. There was really not a mess, um, and so it really wasn't that burdensome or that, um, you know, bad of an activity. So. Um, I, we think we can do that internally, but there are, there's a company that we would like to have, I know my team would like to have the company that, that we saw in action at these other facilities we're at up in the Northeast have the maintenance contract to take care of them. But unfortunately, they don't have an office in Atlanta, um, but they've kind of committed to us that they would work with us if we approach them and develop a relationship that they would perhaps come and do that for us. So we're still kind of trying to work through that. Well, I think we have time for one more question. Any last question? This room right here is so cold. Now, is there a lot of waste going <laughs> Efficient <laughs> air conditioning. Yeah, yes, thank you. That's the subject of the uh, discussion we had in March. <laughs> and that's, that's an interesting uh, comment. The mechanical engineers in the room can speak to that more, but to dehumidify air, we have to supercool it to drop the, the moisture out of it, so then it takes energy to warm it back up. <laughs> Is, I have the same problem in my house. You could do some calisthenics. Well, I just want to mention there's a reception outside so we can take questions outside. And uh, also, if, if somebody is not on the mailing list, uh, George, if you could raise your hand, uh, just let George know and he can add you to the list for the for the next uh, session in the series so thank you <laughs>